and I'm really proud of her courage. That said, um, she actually summed up all the issues, but she also spoke a lot about the dire humanitarian situation, the genocide, which is no longer looming, by the way, which is <coughs> happening. Um, and all of the issues that are really needed to be put on the table so that we see a way out of this crisis. Um, I want to agree with uh, uh, Dr. here to say you cannot solve a problem without looking at the root causes. And it's good that the root causes must correlate to the kinds of solutions we want to bring about. Because as we heard from this panel, there has been a constant statement that says President Kiir has done this. President Kiir has forced out his colleagues and so on and so forth. I want to give a little bit brief of our root causes. And they started, by the way, during the implementation of the comprehensive peace agreements. As a party, uh, I would agree that yes, the SPLM has been responsible for a lot of the problems that the country is going through. But I want to say it's not because the SPLM leadership have not actually dialogue within the party. We almost split uh, during the convention of 2008 because some leaders, and amongst them, uh, Dr. Mashar, had actually raised certain concerns with the style of leadership, with the nature of the constitution of the, of the party, and how the party should actually navigate the country through to independence. Uh, at those crises, we decided to kind of muzzle some of the issues because we, thought, we saw as leaders and as people that it was more important to ensure that the referendum is peacefully um, conducted. Uh, so we did not want to give any reasons for the government in the north to actually use any differences of the party or the, the ruling party for obstructing the referendum. These very differences manifested themselves uh, when we were now, after we have conducted successfully the referendum, when we were discussing the transitional constitution as we prepared for the independence. And the differences were very sharp. A party led by the president and a party led by uh, our chairman of uh, SPLM IO, where we were emphasizing that there is a need for a constitution that, res uh, that reflect the aspiration of the people to address the issues of restructuring the institutions, the very <coughs> governing institution that we used to marginalize the people of South Sudan. That there was a need to have a constitution that addresses the issues of system of governance. And that there was a need to, um, to have um, a constitution that would actually uh, devote more of the power. But instead, President Sanfa made the statement publicly and threatened Parliament with dissolution if they dare vote against the constitution he prepared, which actually consolidated his power, took more power to himself, and became far more inferior from the interim constitution that we had. So now, our chairman, Dr. Riyan Masha, was guilty of speaking up for these kinds of reforms that were needed, and that you did not need to just inherit the very system that we struggle against for over 50 years. And that continued up to the time when it was decided by the membership of the party that <coughs> the SPLM, SPLM has lost vision and direction. When this was raised again with the political leaders and also included Dr. Riyak among them, that President, uh, Comrade Chairman, we need to look into this. We need to reform our parties. We need to address the structural issues. 
We need to listen to our party membership. President Selva took it very personal, and he decided to dismiss his <coughs> whole cabinet, including his running mate, uh, who was then vice president, who is now the chairman of the SBA, in July, in July 2013. Now, that was not enough. The leaders in the SPLM continue to call for a dialogue for political reforms within the party. President Selfa felt that he needed now to consolidate his power. By this time, by the way, the country was already a police state. The, police, the, the first thing that was lost was the voice of the people. And if you all follow, uh, many people disappeared in South Sudan during that time. President Selfa, uh, to finally quench the dialogue and to silence the, the, the leadership, the, 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 the SPLM leaders who were trying to correct things, he introduced violence in 2013. And the rest is history. So these are the root causes. <coughs> so if we're doing this diagnostic, it is very important that you address the issues rather than looking at personalities. Today, if Tabande, who is first vice president with President Selfa, were to stand up and say to President Selfa, look, we have issues that we need, the reforms, we need to address corruptions, we need to address insecurities and the war and so on, he will be treated exactly like how Dr. Mashar has been treated and all the other leaders. So I think this line is very important to, to clarify so that we don't just lump people just because they happen to be uh, in this situation. So this, this to me is very important. I want to also agree that yes, the, the agreement has collapsed. Uh, but I want to say this. The agreement, we as SPLM, SPLM, IO, uh, plus other parties, because that agreement was not only negotiated by the SPLM, SPLM, um, in opposition, and the SPLM government. The political leaders were there. Um, um, the leader of uh, uh, my comrade there, Ambassador Emmanuel, was there. Uh, they're all, they all signatories to the agreement. The church leaders were signatories to, to the agreement. So you could say, in a way, it was an inclusive um, uh, document that actually included civil society, women groups, and so on and so forth. That said, the agreement in our view provides a, almost a blueprint for the transformation in that country. Because it talks about reforms, <coughs> institutional reforms. It talks about the security sector reforms. It talks about the system of governance, the need to look at that. The making of the permanent constitution, the reconciliation and healing, and justice and accountability. And I must add that we as SPLM, SPLA, IO, champion many of those ideals. Those are the programs that we push to make sure, and especially the justice and accountability aspects, and so on. So this is important to note. Um, and that is why we believe that this agreement is worthy of resuscitation. Definitely needs a review. It has collapsed, <coughs> but you don't need to start from the scratch because you do have the blueprint. So that is with regards to the agreement. Since the agreement has collapsed, we say the transitional government of national unity has collapsed. And actually, even this JMA and, and what have you, basically we say the international community should not continue to spend money on institutions that the very document that establishes them has collapsed. Because thereby the agreement, they are supposed to be institution of implementation. Since you don't have an agreement and you don't have the society reporting, and basically I agree that they became mouthpiece of the government in Juba. So that is um, uh, one aspect. I want to come to the idea, the proposed idea of a technocrat government. Now, there is a challenge. First of all, I see it as a situation whereby we don't want to address the issues. We want to gloss over the issues. 
because a trusteeship is basically us giving up. Basically us giving up on a hard-earned independence. Mm. That is one. And to me, that is very, very, very key. <coughs> I say this because we refuse to address the root causes, and instead we look at Kir Macha. And this is not going to resolve any problem. Uh, the other point I want to say about trusteeship is how do you implement it? How do you convince the people of South Sudan that this is what you need and will, uh, will give you the answer? And let me qualify. The UN. Even though the UN has done a good job in the sense that you, they have opened their doors and you now have over 200,000 people who are in the civilian protection camp. However, the UN has not been able to implement its mandate in order to protect the civilians. So let me say it this way. Very few people trust the UN to protect them. Um, so how are you going to implement this? Let me talk about the regional uh, protection force. We look at the politics in the region. We look at the politics in just two minutes. We look at the politics in the region. Yesterday, a court ruling in Kenya has actually uh, dismissed a case of two people who have been abducted. Human rights activists and a, a leader who is actually in the opposition, a leader in the SPLM, SPLI. Um, we've seen the politics in the region and how it is playing out, and the regional interests <coughs> that plays out in South Sudan, and some of which <coughs> Madame Rebecca has just, just mentioned with regards to Sudan. In fact, the, the war of Sudan now is transferred to the South because the, uh, the very um, SPLM norms and the Darfurian groups have become mercenaries fighting the war of self in South Sudan. So, so the war is taking a regional dimension. How do you now use the region to come and actually uh, make them the guarantors of the very trusteeship when they have all these interests as at play? This is very, very, very important to, uh, to, uh, to address. Now let me come to the role of the international community in the implementation of the peace and in as guarantors of the peace agreement. When we were pushed out in Juba, none of these forces actually came to or, or even condemn the kind of violence that President Selfa introduced in J1 and subsequently on the 10th and the 11th. Uh, and the continued violation of ceasefire, the continued pursuit by air, by land, for over 40 days of the then his first vice president and his party and the leadership. Nobody came to condemn this. Instead, the world and the guarantors saw that the solution was in isolating the opposition. What has this done? What has this done? So it's very important to actually question the role of the international community. Have they done enough to actually guarantee the very agreement that has collapsed? I say no, because my chairman on the 11th and the 10th was on constant dialogue with the UN, with the Americans, telling them, please create a buffer zone because you have enough UN troops in Juba so that we can actually reestablish dialogue with President Selfa. We were simply told that not possible. In fact, the head of the UN, the special representative of the Secretary General to the UN, who was the head of the peacekeeping, said it very clearly. My troops are far more inferior in equipment to the SPLM. And let me say, let me add this. Selfa is feeling that he can do all of this because he's getting the pat on the back. A genocide that has been declared, no action so far. He, his deputy national security chief and his bodyguards is praised an American diplomat's car. Not with 50 bullets, but with over 100 bullets. And that was not the first time, that was the third time. What did the American government do? The last administration? Give excuses. Selfa is behaving like a spoiled child who has not been told that you are committing a genocide 
you are uh, uh, killing innocent civilians, in fact, 67 NGO workers have been killed during this war. The continuous hindrance of humanitarian access. This is all done by the government. When you see the report, blame both sides. When you see the details of the report, there's only one side doing all of this. What is the role of the international community in order to, for them to have guaranteed the agreement? They have not used the leverage they had. They have not used the diplomacy that was needed in order to ensure that the agreement was not violated. Thank you very much, Questions. People wanting to ask questions should come to the microphone and phone the line. And while you're doing that, I want to announce that, as Madam Angelina said, we here at American University want to listen to people from South Sudan. We are aware of the dimension of this crisis. The newspapers, unfortunately, focus on other crises in the world. And we will be having another we'll session on Friday, this Friday at 2.30 in the room, organized by a second person in line in which John Prendergast, Ambassador Princeton Lyman and Brian Debe will be talking about South Sudan. Now let me turn to the questions. Um, and we don't have a lot of time, so let's have three people ask questions. If you could identify yourselves. Yes, uh, my name is Bernard Duku. Uh, I live here in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, my first thanks goes to the keynote speaker, uh, Madam Rebecca. Thanks for what you have said and the role you have played in our community, in the nation. My question is to the panel. Um, CAIR has an institution now, and RIAD also has an institution, an army and followers. Is it easy to wish them away and think that we can make an agreement with that Kir and Machar? Because talking with, uh, <coughs> giving this issue to personalities rather than to the institution will not let us go away. It, it will, not, will not let them go away, but will suspend the solution of the problem. So what I need to know from the panel is uh, the fact that these institutions are there and these people have followers. Why is it difficult for the opposition to have a dialogue of themselves and come out with the strategy to change the regime, since most of you are talking of regime change, and maybe face them in another dialogue? So, and do you think, for the three panel, the three people, Emmanuel Kwaje and Dr. Majak, do you think you can have an agreement with that Machar? For Angelina, do you think you can go it alone without the opposition? Thank you. Thank you for your pointed question. That's the second question. Uh, my name is Claire Nicholas. I am a professor here at SAS. Um, the first time I went to South Sudan was in 2001, and I've been going back um, occasionally doing research. Um, the last time I was there was right after independence. I actually want to mention that I met Madame Rebecca in Rumbek in 2001. Um, you do not remember, I'm sure, um, but I do. Uh, my question actually is, is uh, probably mostly geared to Ambassador Aban. Um, my understanding, uh, in my view, the international community was, had a role, uh, was, was somewhat complicit in what is going on now. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to when there was such a push to get to the referendum without addressing a lot of these root causes first. Um, so I, I guess my question is, um, what would you have the international community do now 
um, to shift things, to try to get Salva Kier out and Mr. and Dr. Mashar. Next individual. And who's at the end of the line? Is this, this individual with? Yeah. If, uh, I think, in the spirit of having full dialogue, let's have each of the people in line ask their questions, and then we'll go across the panel, starting with the ambassador, and have answers to the questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Hart Ridi. I'm the uh, deputy uh, representative for the National Demo Democratic Movement in the U.S. And I'm also uh, an AU alumni, uh, year of 2002. And I want to each every one of you here to put hands to yourselves. Uh, you have done so much uh, for the Sudan Peace Act on the Hill. We collect your signatures from here, and we have done a great job. Actually, this is a home for us. Uh, each every one should be proud of you. Uh, my question is very uh, simple uh, to Dr. Majak at Dagon and also Madam Angelina. I really don't understand why you still continue. If you, if you guys think that the SPLM is the problem, and that institution has been uh, kind of uh, deformed beyond reform, why can't you guys just form a new institution? Because I've seen uh, companies here, been here, and corporations in the U.S. When it reached the point where it's not producing anything, the new uh, alumni, young guys, comes up and they build a nice uh, institution. But to my understanding, so far, after you guys are opposing all what is happening in Juba, yet you're calling yourself a spellum, and they see still a spellum in opposition. So to me, uh, it doesn't help me. I would want you guys to explain that. Uh, my second question would be that to, to prove to the American public that you guys are serious and you are real opposition, uh, I have a piece of paper here that I gave a copy to. Uh, the speaker, I mean, uh, the organizer here, that you're going to put your signature here, that you're willing to work with every South Sudanese uh, who are victims or who are in opposition, every single South Sudanese out here, that you're working for the one being, rather than 